I'll give you another one. This is an old uh, kind of East Kentucky fiddle tune called Martha Campbell. One of my favorites. And this is that, that old bacon banjo. Radiodogs.com, and I am live on location with Mr. Corbin Hanslet. I've been trying to get this interview put together for quite quite a while now. And if you know anything about Orthophonic Joy, the album, uh, you will know who Corbin is. Corbin won the uh, National Talent Search for somebody to uh, actually come on that record and, and show the rest of the country and the world that there is talent out there. We just have to tap into it and find these people. And... Uh, Corbin uh, is, a, is a jewel that, that they found here, uh, not too far from where we are today. But uh, Corbin, it's good to meet you. And uh, uh, give me some idea of uh, when you first picked up a, an instrument, a guitar, a banjo, um, and, and what it was like for you. Well, when I was when I was just a little kid, I mean, I always grew up around music. My, mm -hmm. my mama has been a music leader and piano player and organ player in churches all my life and he's yeah. a wonderful singer and my dad is a, a wonderful singer as well and he you know, grew up singing and he actually uh, started playing banjo a little bit back in the 80s but he told me um, that he fell on hard times and he had to decide whether or not he was going to sell his banjo or his pistol <laughs> and usually you know a pistol is a little better home defense than a banjo I guess but uh, it depends on how bad of a player you are I reckon but um, I, I just grew up with music and I, I got my first guitar I guess I was probably, you know, three or four, and it was it was a little first act kid's guitar, and I learned one or two chords on that because my, one of my uncles actually played in a gospel band. He showed me a little bit, but I lost interest, you know, growing up. But when I was, let's see, I guess I was eight years old, eight or nine, I guess I was nine, when I got my first banjo. It would have been Christmas of 2003. Wow. Is when I got my first banjo, and I just, I was just crazy over it. And I, about all I did was, you know, sit and play the thing. And the guy who worked on my mom's car, uh, he played banjo. He lived down the road a couple miles. Wow. And he showed me a little bit. Um, bluegrass style, you know, three-finger style. Exactly. And that's what I learned initially until February of 2004. Mm -hmm. My dad was living in a 4-H center and working there. Right. Uh, in Appomattox, Virginia. I got you. And they had um, kind of an old-time music festival. And... You know, had all kinds of people there and uh, just really great music. And, and there, February 2004, I met folks like uh, Jimmy Costa, Jim Lloyd, Mark Campbell, Alan Jabor was there, and Mike Seeger. And, wow. you know, I met, met all those guys and got to see them play live. And I realized that what I wanted to do was old time. I mean, it was that, that's right. when I was really introduced to it. I grew up hearing bluegrass, old time blues, gospel, everything else. Exactly. Um, 
and any time we were in the car, we were usually listening to the Stanley Brothers, especially right. with my dad. Had little tapes, and every time we'd go in a gas station, you know, you know how gas stations used to have those little tape racks right exactly. by the counter. Yeah. Every time we'd go in there, I'd look and find Stanley Brothers or something. And he'd yeah. buy it for me. But um, I just just grew up with music, you know, and old time and bluegrass. And it was just always a part of me, and it was always what I wanted to do. Amazing. I tell you what, um, just seeing the type of person that you are, the, just the last few minutes I've talked to you. Um, kind of reminds me of uh, Ralph Stanley. <laughs> a couple of those guys, you know, uh, we're all just good people. People have no idea what uh, what they're in store for when they see you perform, though. Things are a little bit different. Um, we could just name any song uh, earlier when we were first talking to you. Mm. Oh, yeah, I know how to play that. And well, I'm sure you do. I mean, well, I, I try and play different <laughs> stuff, you know. I right. try and play blues and bluegrass and old time and some more folky stuff and sure. old country and played uh, played in a Christian rock band for a while and Pretty southern good. rock and, you know. It, hey, wherever it takes you. Yeah, it's all music. Exactly. You, know, exactly. you can express yourself through all of it. Exactly. That's a good thing about it. Um, we're, we're loving this place that you live in, too. Well, I mean, you. this is just a... Uh, uh, I know people that would kill to live here, and I'm one of them, actually. <laughs> but uh, give us an idea of, of uh, where you're living here. Well, we got really, really lucky. We are in, I guess you could almost say, downtown Johnson City. We're mm -hmm. just, I mean, just kind of out on the outskirts of the downtown. But we are living in an 1830s log cabin that was moved from off of Knob Creek right. up uh, outside of Kingsport. That was brought down here in 73, and it was actually our landlord's father who rebuilt it. He was a, wow. a World War II veteran and he uh, brought it here on the 4th of July 1973 and, and we, we're just so lucky. And, oh yeah. And, you know, shady grove of trees, you don't really have much car noise, all you hear is the bird and the birds in the wind and it's, it's wow. Heavy. We got lucky. Well I'm telling you, you, you ever want to sell this thing, if somebody <laughs> wants to sell it, they need to call me. Okay? <laughs> well, we're uh, we're in what's left of the living room now that it's covered up with instruments. Um, but I, I've been asked to pull out a couple banjos and a couple other uh, weapons of destruction and see uh, what we might could say about them. I guess I'll just go down the line here. This is a uh, 1928, well, most of a 1928 Gibson Style One. It was a tenor banjo that I and a couple other friends converted to a five string. But this is. I set this one up to be pretty much exactly like the one that Uncle Dave Macon played uh, for much of his career until he got some open backs from the Gibson Company. He got a little older and um, this was too heavy to do all the tricks he did with them, you know, yeah. spinning them and throwing them around at things. But uh, I, I do a lot of Uncle Dave Macon stuff, so I set that one up to be like it. It's a, it's a good old banjo. Um, this one, this is more, you know, your general bluegrass banjo. This one, my, let me see here, my mu no, my grandmother's cousin's uncle by marriage <laughs> built this in about 1974 for parts. His name was, uh, his name was Vest. Uh, Hiram Vest, I believe, from up in Clifton Forge, Virginia. He built uh, steel guitars and prepared cameras and things like that. Played a bunch of bluegrass on that one. This is this is one of my favorites. This is kind of my main right now. This is a 1916 Fairbanks Vega Electric. So this was right as Vega was um, becoming the Vega company and losing the Fairbanks name. But it's an original five string. I got it back uh, May, the last week of May 2012. Now I went to high school down in Naruna, Virginia, which I'm sure everybody knows where Naruna, Virginia is. That was a joke, but uh, <laughs> went to William Campbell High School, and uh, one of the janitors there, he was this crazy old bird, a uh, real good guy um, named Marvin, and everybody called him Cabbage Head. He was a cool guy, but he told me for four years, he said, man, you got to come over to the house sometime. I got this banjo you got to see. You got to see this old banjo, and you know, I said, all right, Cabbage Head, all right, so, but finally, a week before I graduated, I went over there, and I was in the yard. I waited there about an hour and he showed up and uh, he brings this thing out. Now, of course, it was missing some of the hardware and the hide and it was in real rough shape, but I you know, I knew what it was and I told him, I said, man, 
you know, this this thing fixed up worth a lot of money. And uh, he he ended up giving it to me real cheap, and I fixed it up, and been been playing it pretty much ever since. It's a good banjo. It's her favorite. <laughs> this one I I recently picked up. This is a 19 about a 1910 um, Bacon Professional Number no. Two. It's a good banjo. It's uh, got a nice kind of thumpy old timey sound to it. I might play that one a little bit. Um, this one, actually, this is my most recent acquisition. A friend of mine in Florida by the name of Pat Hargrove actually built this. Um, he is a just a wonderful, wonderful artisan. Uh, he's a cabinet maker by trade, but has been building banjos, and he just does a phenomenal job. I mean, everything everything here is hand done, and you know all the inlay, and it's got a skin hide on it. Got a real nice old timey sound. But he get, he sent that to me. Um, for my college graduation. So, let's go back here now. Level two. And oh, this is a fiddle. I traded this from a friend of mine outside of uh, Withful, Virginia, a little place called Roll Retreat. Um, traded him even for a banjo neck, but it was a 170 year old banjo neck. So, I, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, this This allegedly is an old English fiddle. That dates from sometime around 1815 to 1820, and uh, it's it's had a long life. But it's a it's a good old fiddle. Um, this is one I got back in 2006. This is actually a reproduction of an 1830s or 1840s style banjo or a minstrel banjo. This was built by a friend of mine up uh, up in Southern Maryland, and he builds these things all by hand. I mean everything turns the brass himself all hand done and it is just gorgeous and this is one solid piece of wood going through here the neck and the dowel um, but I worked at Appomattox Courthouse National Historical Park for about eight summers and that was the one I played most of the time um, this I just got earlier in the year this is actually an all wood banjo that came out of a, an estate sale around Damascus Virginia it's got a real well it's in tune. It's got a real neat sound, almost like a dulcimer. But it's a cool banjo. Let's see. This one. Uh, this one was built by a fella from Pound, Virginia, back in the mid-60s. I don't know a whole lot about it, but I I got it got it off a lady whose husband passed. She was selling a bunch of things and picked it up off of her. It's an old mountain style banjo. Just got a little teeny head, but this one I built with the help of Mike Ramsey, really famous banjo builder, in his shop in 2005. I lived in Appomattox, Virginia, and that's where his shop was. And he was moving to Carolina. He told me if I helped him clean up his shop and move his shop and stuff through the summer, that I could build a banjo. So this is this is what I built. And this is actually you know kind of a early Civil War era or pre-Civil War era style banjo. Uh, skinhead, real deep, low kind of tone, fretless. Played that one all the time. And this is my baby over here. This is a <laughs> this is a rock bridge, sloped shouldered, dreadnought, sunburst. This is a uh, pretty much kind of like the old J45s, but better, <laughs> cheaper. That's for sure. But um, made by some guys formerly out of Lexington, out there in Charlottesville. Um, but funny story with this guitar. I, this was in a music store in Lynchburg, not far from where I grew up. And I saw it for a couple of years, and I was just crazy over it. Because my family is originally from Rockbridge County, Virginia. And I couldn't play much guitar, but I knew it was pretty. And it said Rockbridge. And I was a nerd about family history. So I wanted it, even though it had a giant price tag. So one day I jokingly told my mom... Right before I graduated uh, graduated high school, I told her, you know, that would be a really good birthday, graduation, get out of the house gift. And she said, okay, I'll keep that in mind. Of course, you know, to me, that doesn't mean anything. But what do you know, she went in there and bless her heart, she put down a $300 down payment. Or something like that. Around about that. So, uh, so about every dime I had to my name and everything I got for graduation money and every bit of work I could get through the summer went into this old box. But it's a it's a real good guitar. 
that's a good good one but uh, that's that's most of them at least the ones I'm gonna pull out for now <laughs> got a few more collecting dust okay this is one of Uncle Dave Macon's biggest hits a little number called the Cumberland Mountain Deer Chase towards the end of it if you listen real close you can hear the Hear the dogs coming over the ridge. We're coming to the mountain. We're down in Rutherford County, Tennessee. Here we go.
Frankie and Johnny were sweethearts. Lordy, how they did love. Swore to be true to each other, just as true as the stars above. Well, he was her man, but he done her wrong. Well, Frankie went down on the corner to get a little glass of beer. She says, Mr. Bartender, tell me, has my loving Johnny been here? Have you seen my man? I think he's doing me wrong, good Lord. Johnny sitting there on a cot making love to Miss Nellie Bly. Well, she seen that man, good Lord, and he was doing her wrong. Thank you. 
this is one that um, I learned from Mike Seeger. Actually, I got him to teach me. He was playing a show at the Masonic Theater in Clifton Forge, where all my family's from, and got him to show me. I'd heard it on on his album, you know, when I was a kid, and I saw him play it, and I was like, man, you just gotta show me. So he showed me how to play it proper. It's one of my favorites. I actually played it uh, at my grandfather's funeral. Lost Gander.
Corbin Hanslet here, and uh, we're um, we're learning a whole lot of things about this young man. But there's a lot more to be learned. Um, you uh, let me know earlier in the interview that you had gone to UVA Wise, uh, and uh, can you give me some idea how being uh, a little more educated toward music meshes with the talent, the raw talent that you have? How does that work? Well, I while at Wise, I got to play in a couple different settings. I was part of the UVA Wise Bluegrass Band, which you know was good, uh, really good experience, obviously right. playing in a band setting. I had, I had been in some bluegrass bands and other bands around the region of uh, Southside Virginia okay. and played around, but that was, you know, that was a really good experience, but I actually did take some proper music classes. I, when I first got there, um, I, they didn't really inform me that, you know, the amount of majors and minors you had was pending on how many years you were going to be there. So when I got there, buddy, I was a double major and a triple minor. And I thought, shoot, I'm going to get everything I can. And then, you know, one day I went to my advisor and we crunched the numbers and realized I'd be there for seven years. So, we, <laughs> so I cut it back <laughs> and ended up, I was a history major um, and an Appalachian Studies minor. Right. So, I, But I was a music minor for a while, so I took, uh, took some music classes. And, you know, it, it was informative because also at that time I was teaching a lot. Right. That's how I was, you know, trying to make money. Um, was I was teaching at a music store in Norton, just music, and uh, you know, it, it, it helped me a lot to be able to understand to teach others, exactly. but also just the the function of music and, and some of the processes, and right. and that going hand in hand with playing in bands, uh, I guess helped a lot. Helps a whole lot, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, yeah, it did. Well. Uh, there was a nationwide talent search, and uh, you came up, uh, you came up number one in that, of course, for uh, somebody to play on Orthophonic Joy. Um, can you give me an idea of what it was like just to stand there on the stage with Leah Ross and know that you you pulled it off and that you've done a good job and you've done it the right way? I I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I really couldn't. It. Uh... And, and buddy, they surprised me. <laughs> they they pulled a big one on me. Um, I was teaching at Mountain Music School at uh, Mountain Empire Community College in Big Stone Gap, Virginia, mm -hmm. and it was the next to last day. And you know, in the middle of the day, we'd all get together and have lunch. And it was a bunch of us in the auditorium there. And I had submitted. Well, I, I knew that I was one of the three finalists. Right. Because the way it worked is you did your video and waved a while, and then they picked three. And one would get on the album, one would get some gigs, and the other one got like a prize package or something like that. Gotcha. And, you know, I was psyched out that I was just in the final three. I exactly. was really honored to be that. And then when I saw Leah Ross hit the stage and she had a bag in her hand, you know, I could see some things in it. And I said, oh, okay, well, I've, you know, prize package, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, and I was, I was plenty happy with that because, you know, the whole situation, <laughs> here I was at that and all the folks. And, um... I just didn't know what to do. I mean, I was I was utterly speechless when she announced it, and they all started clapping. So I got up there on stage, and I just I just couldn't hardly believe it. I mean, I was utterly dumbfounded. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Hey, a guy that sings like you, it's you know, when you can dumbfound this guy, you've done something. <laughs> um, well, Orthophonic Joy, uh, as we speak, is just jumping off the shelves. Um, you know, I've, I've done three or four interviews pertaining to Orthophonic Joy, and I'm, I'm always telling uh, telling whoever I'm interviewing, hey, I'll be back when it goes gold, or I'll be back <laughs> when it goes platinum. And, and I'm pretty serious about this. Well, I hope <laughs> I know so. It's, we'll I know see. people say these things, but, you know, usually when I say something, I'm, I'm kind of serious we'll about it. We'll keep our fingers crossed. But, yeah, I don't think I'm going to have to. I think you guys have uh, they've gotten together a ton of great talent, and um, did you uh, – were you actually in on just the one song that you did, or did you have a chance to maybe talk to some of the other people that were on the album? Well, 
um, since actually laying down that one track, I have been able to meet some other folks. And the way it worked is I found out, let's see, I found out that Thursday that I had won. And the next Wednesday, I had to drive, well, I had to ride to Nashville and lay down my track. Uh, but, you know, we got to the studio there and I, I met Carl. Yeah. And it was just, I mean, he, he is a wonderful person. And, and really, he's the one, he and Rusty are the ones behind the album. And Carl was right. basically producing pretty much everything on there and putting it all together. And he has just done a magnificent job. But uh, when when I got in studio there, you know, I was kind of worried. It's, you know, I, I grew up, everybody saying, oh, you know, he went to Nashville. He recorded in Nashville. And it's just yeah. kind of that uh, that mystery of, of the Nashville far sure. away. And that was the farthest west I'd ever been to. So I got there, and I was a little worried. But I met Carl, and, and you know, we went through the song, figured out how we wanted to do it. And it, it went really smooth. And it was just a right. magnificent experience and a wonderful learning experience too. Yeah. Mr. Carl Jackson is, is somebody else that we'll probably speak to um, fairly soon. But uh, when you speak, it seems to me that when you speak that uh, name in Nashville, uh, a lot of people take notice. Oh yeah. And they, they know how talented he is and they know the ability that he has to bring the talent in whoever he works with. And uh, I feel like he's done a, just a great job uh, with you, with your track on the album. Just a tremendous song. Uh, one of my favorite uh, records right now is, is Orthophonic Joy, and, and I listen to everything. Oh, yeah. So, uh, but, uh, so you got through, uh, now you're doing a lot of uh, PR stuff, you're, you're going around. Uh, let us know where people can see you or what's, what's going on. Well, actually, uh, let's see, I guess this Wednesday, this Wednesday I'm going to be a part of Marty Stewart's Late Night Jam at, uh, at the Ryman. Really awesome. honored to be part of that. I've been real tickled. Uh, <laughs> Going to be doing that. I've got a, a little solo performance I'm doing July 11th up in Warm Springs, Virginia. Cool. Um, you can look at my website for more details. What's that web address? CorbinHazlett.com. I think we just got it up like two days ago. So <laughs> <That's> I'm, <okay. laughs> hey, hey. I'm pretty sure that's it. Okay, good. Deal. Um, uh, let's see. And also, I just a few other things here and there. Well, I some bigger ones. I'll be at Rhythm and Roots. Good deal. Uh, the birthplace country music's right. Rhythm and roots. That's the second weekend of September. Right. And I'll be there. I have a solo slot. I'm also probably going to be playing with the ETSU Old Time Pride Band, which I'm going to be a part of this fall. Good deal. And um, I think there's going to be an Orthophonic Joy thing there too. I'm not 100 percent sure. Should be. The second of October. Um, yeah, the second of October. I'll be with an Orthophonic Joy showcase at IBMA in Raleigh at um, the Wide Open Bluegrass Festival they have there. There we go. And that's Friday evening, October 2nd. I'll be a part of that. Amazing. So, yeah. It's, so they're going to keep you busy. Well, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I'd like I told you earlier, I'm trying to, trying to relax a little bit this summer for the next school semester, but, you know, any other gigs or shows or anything else, I'm yeah. completely open to it. Right? So anybody who's interested can go on uh, your website. Mm -hmm. And or can send you a message or, or on Facebook. My Facebook is, you know, Corbin Hazlett. Right. I, I think I, yeah. <laughs> Facebook is still new to me as well. So it's kind of like me. I let Tony do the, <laughs> the <laughs> fancy computer stuff, okay, mm -hmm. because I can get lost in that stuff real quick. But uh, I think that what you got going on is, is very good. I, you know, uh, just as a everyday person, I see a bright future for you. What 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 do you want to accomplish uh, with with your talent and what's going on right now? Well, I want to I want to play as much as I can, right. and I want to share as much music with people that I, as I can because you know there's so much there's so much good music that hasn't been heard in a long time. You know, old old timey music, yes. but I mean just the early country and, and that kind of music that was recorded around the time of the Bristol Sessions up to the 30s and 40s and 50s. And there's, that, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I want to bring back to people because it's it's truly American music and it's it's right. uh, it's personal music. You know, it's not necessarily um, a commercialized music. It's it's right. a it's an individual's musical expression, and that's that's kind of what I want to further and share. And and not just the music itself, but also the knowledge of the music and the people who originally. Right, you know, performed it and played it in the history of it. I yeah. was a history nerd and still am, so I like to <laughs> tie the two together as much as I can. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, it's been a great day here uh, in Johnson City, Tennessee with Corbin Hazlett, and uh, 
Net Radio Dogs is very proud to have uh, come in and, and we've seen a little bit more of the personal side of the man that uh, you're all going to know very soon. For NetRadioDogs.com, it's Rick Dollar, Tony Dean. Thanks for watching.